Hello again. Again, my name's Nicole Klein. I'm with the Policy Circle. I'm our Director of Expansion and External Relations. And it is my pleasure to introduce our next facilitator, Jason Hayes, who will be leading an insightful discussion on all of the complexities of the energy industry and how it relates to each of us. Jason Hayes is the Director of Environmental Policy for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, which is a nonpartisan research and educational institute that is dedicated to advancing liberty and opportunity for all people through research and education. Jason has spent almost three decades studying and working in environmental and energy policy in a variety of roles, including as a backcountry ranger, a forester, and a researcher for the Fraser Institute. He now heads up the Mackinac Center's Environmental Policy Initiative and serves as adjunct faculty member to Northwood University. Please join me in welcoming Jason and our other panelists to the stage. All right, thank you. Uh, first off to the policy circle, to Sylvie specifically, and Sylvie, wherever you are, we're praying for a, a quick and speedy recovery. Uh, to Angela, Stacy, Courtney, Lorna, Nicole, and Maddie, and if I've forgotten any of the others, um, thank you to you as well. Uh, thank you also to the ladies last night who made me feel welcome. The one and only guy in the room, thank you for, <laughs> for welcoming me in and uh, making me part of the group, I appreciate that. And so, as we start out here, uh, we were asked to just kind of go through and introduce ourselves. And so I'll start, uh, open up to Melissa to explain who she is, where she's from, and then why she got interested in energy and electricity. Thanks, Jason. And thank you for uh, the invitation to participate in this panel. I was really honored to be invited to speak today. Uh, my name's Melissa Dykes. Um, I hail from Northeast Florida, so just down the road. And um, I got into this business, um, originally started at the, at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., researching how to expand infrastructure services to in developing countries. And as a little baby researcher, one of the things that struck me profoundly is the way that we define infrastructure, the way we experience it here in the United States, can be dramatically different depending on where you are in the world. And um, so, for example, since we've spent the morning talking about water, when we think about a water utility, we typically think about a water treatment plant that puts water in pipes underground that brings it to your home that has indoor plumbing. But in some parts of the world, access to clean water can look like a tanker truck that delivers water to people who line up with their buckets each day to be able to receive drinking water. It makes the difference between having access to clean water and not, or cut down, cuts down on walking time to retrieve water each day, um, primarily for girls and women who are responsible for that task so that they can do things like go to school. It profoundly changes people's lives. And that beginning of my career really um, nailed home how important critical infrastructure services are to our day-to-day -day lives, um, how important they are. And that inspiration stayed with me through 10 years of investment banking, um, through energy development work, um, most recently as President Chief Operating Officer and Interim Chief Executive Officer of a large municipal utility um, in Northeast Florida and continues to inspire me today. And then same question for you, Crystal. Of course. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Crystal Stiles, the Senior Director of Economic Development for Florida Power and Light Company. FPL is the largest electric utility in the state of Florida, and we are part of NextEra Energy, which is a Fortune 200 company headquartered right here in Palm Beach County. So if you haven't officially been welcomed to Florida and to Palm Beach yet, let me officially do that. We're so glad to have you here um, participating in this wonderful event. Um, I've been with the company about 10 years. Unlike Melissa, I don't have a long history in the energy industry. I started my career in economic development in rural Virginia, and I moved to Florida about 13 years ago uh, to lead public sector economic development just north of here, and I'm very passionate about um, the value of a job. Uh, when, when people, individuals have jobs, they have greater opportunities for success. Um, families have better opportunities for success, children can go to college, um, it just makes a huge difference, and I'm very passionate about that. And so 10 years ago, when I had the opportunity to join a very well-respected company in the energy industry to lead their economic development team, I jumped at the chance. I've learned, I, that day I didn't know anything about energy. I didn't know the difference in a megawatt and a megawatt hour, which I'm, some days I still don't know that. Um, 
But you know, energy is a really important driver in our economies, and it's important. Um, it is something that makes a difference when the power is not on, that changes that opportunity that we talk about with economic development and, and the value of a job. So um, I love what I do. I'm passionate about economic development. I'm really excited to be here today to talk with you all a little bit more about how we approach infrastructure and innovation at NextEra. All right, and you already heard my background, so I will not rehash that, but we'll move directly into the discussion that initially the, the first slide that I had was uh, showing a, an electric utility bill. And so that bill was kind of the, the setting here where we're looking at how to do a quick kind of review of a report that, that I produced last year. And there we go, there's the, <laughs> the first slide was um, of the report, the cover, which was called Electricity in Michigan, a Primer. And it, again, it just kind of reviews exactly how electricity gets to your home or to your business. And for those that are interested, there's copies of a few of those publications on a back table over there. You're welcome to pick them up. And it is kind of an Electricity 101. Here's how electricity works. Now, it's focused on Michigan, but it also is applicable to other states. And so we wrote that report uh, really to give legislators, media, and other people an idea of how electricity works because it can be a pretty confusing situation. It's a, it's a big system and there's a lot involved there. But So the utility bill, that section of the report actually kind of covers some of the terms that you can expect to see. So if you look at your bill, you'll see um, terms that are often confusing, things like distribution charges, peak hours, peak rates, energy charges, and even great fun ones like power supply cost recovery charge factors. You guys all know what that is, right? <laughs> so the report tries to explain some of those things to uh, the reader. And then as we move on to the next slide, what I wanted to do is explain that there is a lot that goes into the generation system. And so the next slide shows the breakdown between generation, transmission, and distribution. And so the report describes how generation, and generation is really where we get electricity from. It's created using a variety of technologies and fuels. And then transmission is how we transport that electricity across long distances using high voltage wires. And then distribution is how it gets, that, that high voltage electricity gets stepped down and then uh, transmitted or distributed to your homes and to your businesses. So, the next slide talks just gives one example of some of the fuels and technologies that we use. And so the one picture that I showed was a, uh, a combined cycle gas turbine, which is more and more one of the technologies that's being used today to produce electricity. But we use a variety of other fuels, natural gas, coal, nuclear, hydro or hydroelectric, and then wind and solar are other names. And then in the, the following slide, what I wanted to do is just, just touch on it and then say, we have two experts here to discuss the next part. Utilities are how we get our electricity. And so um, going to Crystal, what, as we discussed what we wanted to cover before the conference, we wondered if you could help us to understand some things. Who are some of the players in the electricity industry? What companies or other stakeholders are involved with producing electricity and transporting electricity? And then what are some of the different utilities that make up our system? Sure, thanks for that question. And I'll try to answer it sort of in the context of how we approach our day-to-day -day business. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Nextair Energy is a significant Fortune 200 global company. Um, and it is one of the largest infrastructure companies in the United States. We have operations in 49 states and Canada. Um, and we are, we, so we're the largest infrastructure company in the US and we're one of the largest capital investors in the country. Um, and those investments really create significant economic benefits across the country, but we're really focused on making sure that those investments um, are focused on making the nation's electric infrastructure clean, reliable, affordable. Um, and the, our customers are both residential and business customers here in Florida, and then all of these that are listed on the screen, investor-owned utilities, municipals, um, electric co-ops, and independent power producers across the country. 
Um, you know, as one of America's largest capital investors, we intend to invest between 50 billion and 55 billion just in 2022 alone in the electric infrastructure. Um, we also paid about $1.8 billion in local and state taxes just last year, which as you all know, contributes significantly to our local governments, police, schools, fire systems, and so all of these energy providers are contributing significantly to the communities where we live and work. Um, an economic analysis suggests that those investments have created about 80,000 jobs for our country um, in 2019 alone, when you think about it all total. Um, and then when you think about Florida, so Florida is a stakeholder for, for the energy industry. You know, we love doing business here. We think it's an attractive place to do business because of all its low tax pro-business policies. Um, and that is how it really ties in economic development. And, and as we talk about attracting new business investment to Florida, they really care a lot about, a lot of those companies care about energy, not only supply, but also the type of energy that they're getting. So more and more companies are really focused on sustainability, on renewable energy, um, and they want to be able to demonstrate that their source of power is going to drive them towards um, carbon-free uh, future. And, you know, it's not just net carbon reduction these days, it's really total and absolute uh, carbon reduction. And so as we think about the investments that we make in wind and solar um, and battery uh, powered, um, it's very important to driving the economic engine of our state. So hopefully that sort of gets into a little bit of that for you, Jason. Yeah, definitely. And then Melissa, um, you're with JEA, which was described on your website as a community-owned utility. And so we, we have some names here, but community-owned is not on the list that I wrote about. But what does community-owned utility mean? How is JEA different than FPL Florida Power and Light? What are some of the customer bases, the numbers of customers that you serve? How would they be different than like a more regional investor-owned utility? And then uh, the last question that we came up with was, how would a city or community opt to run its own utility? Why would it not just stick with the, the other versions? Um, just a quick correction, formerly with JEA, okay. uh, which is the community-owned <laughs> utility in Northeast Florida. Um, I, I'll start with a global perspective on, on some of those questions. Um, there all, are all kinds of different ways of providing infrastructure services to communities. And, and from a global perspective, um, often the single largest barrier to expansion of infrastructure where infrastructure is lacking is access to capital. And um, there have been many studies that have been done on how to just frankly how to bring in more dollars into those places in the world where infrastructure is needed so badly. And uh, from when it comes to modern distribution of electricity, what those studies have shown is um, that whether it's um, a uh, publicly owned utility or privately owned utility, there's no material difference in terms of cost to customers or service quality. And so in those areas of the world, there are, the focus should remain on attracting capital in whatever form it can come in. Um, in the United States, we have a modern distribution system for electricity. Um, in the U.S., about um, the vast majority of customers, in fact, about 75% of customers are served by privately owned utilities, um, like Crystals. It's about, um, they're, they're called investor-owned utilities, they're sometimes abbreviated IOUs. Um, another 15% of customers are served by municipally owned utilities, that's the community owned means municipal utility, um, in my former employer. And, um, those are public power utilities um, across the country. About 10% of customers are served by electric cooperatives, and, and co-ops were originally created to fill a void where their, the population density was so low that those areas in the United States weren't profitable for other kinds of utilities to serve. And just a quick little cocktail hour fact, um, even though co-ops only serve 10% of customers in the United States, they actually provide electric distribution service to more than 50% of the land area. Uh, in the United States. Um, I do think it's, uh, when it comes to trade-offs between IOUs or co-ops or public power, it's, it's very difficult to generalize about some of the risks and trade-offs because they are so situationally and geographically specific. Um, the Energy Information Association offers us some data that we can look to for aggregate numbers, like for example, in recent years, public power utility rates to customers have been lower than those for investor-owned utilities. 
Um, although there are some notable exceptions to that, and I would be remiss if I didn't point to Crystal's company as one of being one of those exceptions. Um, EIA data also show higher reliability statistics among public power utilities than IOUs. Um, there are some experts that suggest that that's due to the, the nature of service ter ter territories for public power utilities. They tend to be more urban, um, which may result in some of that difference. Um, I do think it's, since we spent the morning talking about water, I think it's also instructive to talk a little bit about what the structure of water utilities in the United States, um, because there it's flipped, and, and municipal water systems provide service to the vast majority of people in the United States. Um, but even in the U.S., as we talked about earlier this morning, our infrastructure is severely underinvested. Uh, we have aging infrastructure throughout the United States, and we're going to need about $750 billion invested in water and wastewater over the next 20 years just to continue to provide reliable and safe drinking water and sufficient wastewater treatment capacity in the United States. It is an enormous amount of capital. And so when it comes to water and wastewater utilities, um, there is value in attracting capital in whatever form that takes, whether it's locally public capital, federally public capital, private capital. It's, we're going to need all those dollars to be able to upgrade those systems to, um, to ensure reliable service um, into the future. Um, and I'll just offer a little, I'll close on a little personal note. It's, I've worked with a lot of different people across a lot of different kinds of utilities over the course of my career. And one of the things that almost universally we have in common is that we're all in this to provide critical service to our community, to make our communities better. And so matter, no matter what kind of utility provides your service at home, you can take comfort that there's good people who are behind it. Yeah, absolutely. There are people working hard and doing the hard work. I always think we had good friends when I lived in Arizona who were linemen. And I always respected those guys that go out and climb up the poles and make sure our lights are on. Usually in the worst weather you can imagine, they're out there keeping your electricity on. So kudos to those guys. Now, we hinted at uh, discussing some of the, <clears throat> pardon me, decisions that go into deciding which technologies and fuels that we use to power our grid today. And then as we look forward, what will power our grid tomorrow? And both. JEA and FPL have prominent discussions on their websites about the value of both clean and reliable electricity and electric supply. So that overarching goal of most utilities then brings us to an issue that uh, is often called or referred to as the energy trilemma. The, the idea that different organizations describe it differently, but the idea is basically you want secure, affordable, and sustainable electricity or clean or emissions free or low emission electricity. And so we want to be able to make sure that we have reliable supplies so that when you flick the switch on the wall, you know the lights are going to come on. You want it affordable because if people can't afford their electric bills, then I mean they, they get disconnected or and you're not really getting that service. And then you want it clean, obviously, because we all breathe the same air. And we all drink the same water. So you want to make sure you balance those three, and it's a difficult balance to, to achieve. Typically, when we're discussing that energy trilemma, they always say, you can get two of them right, and the, the third one is extremely difficult to add on. And so just to, to go over a few examples, we have examples of natural gas. With the advent of fracking, natural gas has become much more affordable, and it's definitely much more reliable. Now you still have emissions that are associated with using gas, although gas is much cleaner than, say, is coal. So in terms of CO2 emissions, if you look at nuclear, nuclear absolutely crushes reliability. It's extremely reliable. Uh, it's zero emissions, and then uh, it's it's also very uh, sorry. It's reliable, but it, it struggles on affordability sometimes when you're dealing with building nuclear plants, they're extremely expensive to build. Now, once they're up and running, they produce electricity very efficiently, low cost, and again, very clean. Now, renewable energy, wind and solar, they're good on the emission side, obviously, because they don't produce any uh, emissions, but they do require extensive land use. So that's one of the challenges that we're facing. And then also, as we look forward and build more of it, we're finding that in some cases, not all, obviously, but we're dealing with environmental and ethical issues associated with where are we getting the, the supplies, called transition minerals and that sort of thing. Um, 
we, we often have to source those transmission minerals from developing nations. And so there's some issues, again, associated with the ethics of that or the, the emissions or the, the environmental impacts of sourcing those sources there. And so the overall goal of energy policy, we need to decide how to address that, that three-part thing, the energy trilemma. And so for, for Crystal, on the issue of innovation and clean, reliable, affordable supplies, which you spoke about previously. How does FPL work to achieve this balance? What are you folks trying to do? And then what drives innovation in the energy sector to serve your customers and foster economic development? Sure. Well, you know, I really think about innovation as, um, you know, really reinventing yourself and always looking toward the future and planning for the future today. Um, you know, if you think about the, the transformation that our world has been through, just, I mean, technology changes so fast. Two years ago, we didn't have 75% you know, of the technologies that we have today. And today we're live streaming this, uh, this conference all over the place and um, people are participating in that way. So we just, it consistently transforms the way that we do our business and it, and it is the same for energy businesses, just like mine. Um, and, you know, Innovation is really part of the culture at FPL. It has been since our early beginnings in 1925. And you know, all of our men and women across the company really pride themselves in innovation and thinking creatively about how to solve problems. You know, if you think about our company, we started here in South Florida in 1925. And so we were able to power um, America's journey to space in the 1960s. We powered the first space shuttle launch. Um, we ushered in the nuclear era of the 1970s. And um, we were the first company outside of Japan to win the Deming Prize for quality in 1980. So, you know, I think that that proves that we've long embraced innovation as a way of doing business. Um, and we continue that today. We really focus on building America's strongest and smartest energy grid. So we've invested billions of dollars since 2016 to harden our infrastructure so that uh, we have a beautiful day in South Florida here today, but we are prone to interesting weather here. And so those investments that we make in our energy grid and our infrastructure um, ensures that we can continue to provide that reliability that our customers expect at a cost that they, they can afford. Um, we've actually been able to pr improve our reliability over 40% over the course of the last few decades, which is really important when you think about people um, struggling to face whatever's happening weather-wise, whether it be a hurricane or even a pandemic, they count on that electricity to come on. Um, we also in, continue to invest in smart technology. We've deployed five million smart meters across our system, as well as 110,000 um, other intelligent devices that let us actually predict outages before they happen. They make sure that we can continue to, to provide power. Um, and it allows us to proactively detect faults before they might happen. So we're able to go out and make repairs um, before they're disastrous um, and catastrophic. So that has really um, transformed the way that we deliver power to our customers. Um, and we're also focused on advanced technology to prevent power issues. Um, we have a wonderful drone program these days. We are actually um, one of a very few uh, companies that is certified by the FAA for um, out-of-sight drone flight, and we have a team of pilots on staff, um, and they proactively assess our equipment. So, um, you know, it, and I'm sure you know this, um, Melissa, and, you know, it wasn't so long ago that we would deploy helicopters to fly our infrastructure and look for, for problems, uh, problem areas, and today we can deploy drones to very quickly tell us where there might be areas of vegetation, areas of, of damage, um, so it saves us time, it saves us money, and we're able to stay online uh, more. And then we also have an autonomous rover program. Um, and I think we have a picture of that maybe on the screen um, that really monitors and assesses our, our larger infrastructure, our substation equipment. Um, and that helps us understand if there's flooding or if there's going to be damage. These rovers have sensors and cameras on them that allow them to see uh, much more detail than we can see with the human eye. And so, again, it really um, helps us pre-assess where there might be infrastructure issues and proactively resolve those problems before they become an even bigger problem for our customers. Well, and then for Melissa, building on what Crystal just talked about, how do we supply essential electricity services regardless of weather conditions? And then how does JEA or other municipals 
work to supply the cleanest, most reliable, most affordable electricity they can. I'm gonna build on um, a little bit of this um, triangle concept that you talked about um, in the opening to, to this section of the discussion. Um, some of the balancing of priorities uh, is, um, has been absolutely transformed by the evolution of technology over the past decade. And um, it's something that's actually really exciting, is when you see the private sector, when you see evolution of technology, when you see innovation cause companies and industries to start to leapfrog government regulation um, and do things that just make sense because they make sense for the world in every priority, in all three of those pillars, um, then you've achieved success, you've achieved a win-win. And that's some of what we've seen in the energy industry over the last decade. Um, it's a really exciting time to be in this business because the cost curves have come down precipitously for renewables, allowing utilities to add renewables at scale to portfolios without having to ask these fundamental values-based questions that we wrestled with a decade ago or less um, about whether it's more important to protect our environmental future or whether it's more important to affordably serve our customers. And when you've got customers who struggle to pay their bill every month, that's a really tough values-based question to try to answer. So we live in a world now where we don't have to answer those questions so definitively because we can do both. Um, and it's amazing. But to be able to add renewables at scale to a portfolio, you got to be able to serve the maximum amount of electricity that all of our customers use all at the same time. And that does mean looking at the weather and thinking very carefully, carefully about what that means for reliability. So outside of some of the hurricane evolution that, that Crystal talked about, um, what we're really thinking about is the very coldest winter morning, uh, for those of us that use electric heating, um, or the very hottest summer afternoon. What does that look like from a portfolio of resources perspective to be able to make sure that that system stays reliable even as it becomes greener? And so you think about something like a solar resource where you, you can add utility scale solar to the system, um, which is fantastic from an environmental perspective, except our winter peak when, we were at J when I was at JEA um, was a January morning when it was dark. And so you've got to be able to solve for having enough resources, even as you add these renewables, to make sure that we can provide reliable service during that January morning. Um, what, one really important bridge, um, and you touched on a little bit in the opening, one really important bridge between where we are today and where we're going from a technology future perspective is natural gas. It is a fossil fuel, but natural gas resources are flexible. Um, they provide the ability to shape around uh, renewables that get added to the system that may not be on when the wind isn't blowing and when the sun isn't shining. And as technology has evolved, technology for natural gas has evolved too. Um, and those resources have become so almost shockingly efficient um, so that cost to customers gets reduced and environmental impact gets reduced. And we all of a sudden have a bridge to get us from where we are today to a much greener future where we don't, again, have to make those trade-off decisions between affordability and reliability. And we've got a system that can accomplish both. Um, when it, from a policy perspective, since this uh, discussion is really focused on policy, one, one of the things that's challenging for utilities in this kind of environment is um, you're talking about building resources that are designed to be built and used in the ground for 30, 40, 50, sometimes longer um, number of years. You talked about nuclear. Nuclear resources are meant to be out there for 80 or 100 years. Um, and technology is evolving so quickly that making decisions about building, generating resources is incredibly difficult for utility executives because we literally don't know what technology is going to be available to us 10 years from now. And you're making decisions about resources that are meant to be around for 30 years. So it's both a challenging and a very interesting time to be in this business. Yeah, and so people understand a, a, a unit like a nuclear plant is not designed to do what, what's called ramping. It's, it doesn't go up and down and up and down the way that oftentimes if you're relying on wind or solar, sometimes the wind blows. And when the wind blows, then the wind turbines are producing electricity. At that time, you need the other sources to ramp down. Nuclear does not do that. Uh, the older style of coal plants doesn't do that. But natural gas does that extremely well. So natural gas can kind of go down when the wind is up or when the solar is up. And when the solar or wind go down, you can fire up a gas plant and you can have that kind of, you know, that balancing effect. That's what, what uh, Melissa was talking about. And so as we look out to the future, um, I'll go to Crystal first. 
How does the private sector serve as a critical player in technology, energy technology, innovation? Like what role can they play? And then what do you see or what does FPL see the future look like in terms of energy technology, recognizing that we just heard that, wow, this is a difficult thing to actually, I mean, actually predict is, is difficult. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, I think the private sector plays an incredibly important role in uh, technology innovation and looking at the future, um, as we talked about before. And, you know, Melissa is right that today's energy future is really built in natural gas. Um, FPL is a, a primarily natural gas focused uh, company today. Uh, but we are looking and have always looked at other alternative and diverse energy sources that could be. Uh, reliable um, power. So you're right that you can install solar panels that only provide energy when the sun is shining, but if you pair them with a battery, all of a sudden you unlock the power of the sun um, at times when the sun isn't shining. And so currently FPL is involved in uh, deploying 30 million solar panels by 2030 across the state of Florida. We call it our 30 by 30 plan. We're actually going to exceed uh, that promise by 2030, and we are deploying battery technology with all of the solar uh, fields that we're constructing so that we can better maximize that solar uh, energy. And we wouldn't have known that just a few years ago. Um, we're building the, lar the world's largest battery storage system on the west coast of Florida in Manatee County, and that's teaching us an awful lot about um, how to efficiently use that battery technology. Same with wind. It's all about storing that the energy when it's created and deploying it when it's needed. And so those are the, the challenges with, with wind and solar. Um, you know, we also believe that there are gonna be new transformative technologies uh, that are gonna change the way we, we receive our energy in the, in the future, including green hydrogen. Uh, we just launched a 10 megawatt pilot, uh, just actually very near here, that's gonna teach us a lot about creating hydrogen from the sun. Uh, which we have in abundance here in South Florida. Um, and we believe that that's going to drive a carbon-free future. Um, so, you know, even though we may not have seen green hydrogen as a possible technology even 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, we see it as a real uh, reality now, um, you know, as it's, as it's here and, and plan to invest a lot in that. And, you know, that's just really the beginning. So as we look at solar, we're, we're looking at electric vehicles and, and charging as well as green hydrogen. You know, we're just really scratching the surface um, on those innovative technologies. And, and we develop a lot of those in-house. We do a, a lot of research and development in-house. But we also recently um, launched an innovation hub um, called 35 Mules at our FPL headquarters here in Juneau Beach. And it is really focused. It's the first innovation hub powered by a global energy company. It looks a little bit like a business incubator. Uh, we're growing startups in the energy industry. We have six of them in-house today. And they are really focused on helping, uh, as they're developing their technologies, they're changing the way that we think about technology and they're changing the way that we think about our businesses. And to just maybe step back into my day job with economic development, when they graduate from our innovation hub, we'll plant them here in South Florida and allow them to grow and help them to grow into larger energy focused companies. Um, but we really benefit from working with them day in and day out. They help us think bigger, they challenge us to to, uh, to disrupt ourselves, they challenge our old way of thinking, um, and they're helping accelerate, I think, the identification of new technologies that will continue to change the way that we deliver energy. All right, and then for Melissa, as, as we go into the future, one issue that um, people always uh, wonder about is utility customer relations. So what do you see as the future of relations as we're using these new technologies and maybe dealing with some reliability issues or changing cost structures and that? Where do we go from here? I think that's such a profoundly interesting question. You know, in the old days, uh, we used to joke that we were slightly more popular than the IRS. Um, and we're very proud of ourselves for that. Um, but um, the relationship that people have with their utility companies has really evolved as technology has evolved. So uh, think about your own relationship with your utility. Maybe you have an electric vehicle, uh, maybe you have solar panels, maybe you have a battery, maybe you have none of those things. Um, but you probably have an intimate relationship with Amazon, uh, or at least my family does. Um, and for better or for worse, the way that you interact with Amazon is shaping customer expectations for how easy it should be to do business with your utility company as well. 
And so customer expectations are evolving to expect interactions that are customized, that are technology forward, that provide information at your fingertips and that are frankly very easy. And utilities are stepping up to answer some of those changing customer expectations. In the future, uh, it's always fun to daydream about what the future might look like. And in the future, it, it might look like uh, most of us having solar panels and batteries at home or fuel cells uh, in our garage that provide most of our energy service at home, um, using the grid just to balance out our energy service um, or to provide backup power when we need it. Um, but one of the things from a policy perspective we really have to not forget about is that not everybody today or in the future will have the money to put solar panels on their roof. Um, not everybody's going to be able to afford to afford to put a fuel cell in their garage. And so as we think about policy around energy and we think about where this might be heading in the future, it's really important for us to make sure that we're not leaving behind the people who can't afford those things and that we approach energy policy and energy rate structures in a way that doesn't result in escalating costs for people who rely less and less on a central electric distribution grid and fairly apportions costs for all customers. If we get that right, the future of energy is really exciting. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and so future for you folks, one thing that I always like to do is before I wrap up a, a discussion is just kind of look at how you and the audience can get involved. And so first and foremost, I'd encourage you all to get educated and get up to date on the things that are happening in with your utilities, in your community, and that sort of thing. And so one example of a way that you could do that is feel free to grab the, the publications that um, we at the Mackinac Center have put together and left on the back table there, or if you, do, if you don't uh, get a copy, they, they are also available through our virtual um, uh, online app, through the, through the conference app, you can get them there too. But get educated and then get involved. And so one of the things that I'd say is that there's a, a, a principle, an economic principle, the Pareto principle, also often referred to as the 80-20 rule, which is 80% of the work gets done by 20% of the people. The reality is that's more like 95-5. 95% of the work gets done by 5% of the people. And if you make sure that you are some of that 5%, I mean, the people in this room obviously are already motivated and willing to make the effort to come to a conference like this and, and get up to speed in what's happening. So you're already well on that pathway. Keep going and keep doing that. So if you get involved, you can have an outsized impact in your community. So do things like write letters to the editor, talk to your elected officials and let them know, this is what I think, this is how I feel about electricity and electricity services. These are the, the fuels or the technologies that we should be using in our area. Then also make sure that you're handing out business cards or networking with the people in this room so that when you're discussing these things in your own policy circles at home, that you've got um, you know, somebody that, that you can bounce an idea off of or you can check before you make a pronouncement or before you, send, before you hit send on that email to the letter to the editor. You can just check with a trusted friend or ally, so make sure you're doing that. And then just remember that energy impacts literally everything that you're doing in your life. So the food that you buy in your grocery store, the video games that your kids play, the schools that your kids attend, they're all impacted by the price of electricity and where you get your electricity. So make sure that you're getting involved and that you're really staying a part of the discussion. And with that, I'm seeing a yellow light flash at me here, so I believe it's time for us to wrap up. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you again to the Policy Circle, and please give Melissa and Crystal a hand.